good afternoon um, from Berlin. Um, the sun is also shining here uh, very brightly, so uh, a lot of solar power um, powering my laptop right now. Um, that's a good thing. Um, I just very quickly want to introduce myself. Um, I worked with smart grids or in a smart grid project for about five and a half years. Um, I was head of uh, project coordination uh, of a project here in Berlin uh, that set up a smart grid from 2011 on. So very early in this whole uh, smart grid area. Um, after that, I uh, quickly co-founded an accelerator for high-tech startups um, that was very digital centered. Um, and for the last three and a half years, uh, I worked at a think tank here in Berlin um, to look at the policy side um, of what uh, could the energy transition um, do better or what could policy do better with the energy transition and also smart grids obviously played a big role in that. Um, now I also have a new job um, which is also quite exciting. Um, I will from now on uh, try to co-found a new NGO that actually takes this whole think tank uh, business to another level and does more or less a do tank. Um, so some kind of a project developer for regulatory fringe cases. Um, if you like, uh, I can uh, talk about in the Q&A a bit more about that. But now, um, without further ado, I would like to um, jump right in um, into my talk about smart grids today. So um, to get started, I want to start with what kind of problem do we actually have? Um, I think most of you know what kind of emission trajectories we are um, currently on. Um, we now have the corona crisis, um, which will bring emissions down quite a bit, but that's not something we want to apply every year to reach our uh, climate goals. Um, also, the IPCC um, says that we need some kind of uh, unprecedented, uh, unprecedented political effort in order to reach our goals. Um, and I just want to have a very quick view on how are we doing so far. Um, there is um, an initiative called Climate Action Tracker that actually looks at the policies in place around the world um, that uh, try to uh, reach the, the climate goals of the Paris Agreement. Um, and as you can see, gray or red or yellow is not so good. And how are we doing? Well, we are doing not so good when we look at it in total. Um, so we need to speed things up. We need to step up our game um, concerning the energy transition. Obviously, there are uh, different areas where we can actually reduce our emissions but the energy sector is the sector that is probably the easiest where we have the um, biggest impact in a very short amount of time. And that is what counts that we bring down our emissions as soon as possible. Um, we also, um, and that is something that uh, especially here in Germany is discussed a lot, um, uh, maybe not that openly, but uh, a lot of people tend to think that there will be some kind of magical technology that will save us all and that we just have to wait for that. Um, in uh, uh, the Greek mythology, there was the deus ex machina that came and saved the whole play um, when uh, everything seemed lost. Um, and we get more and more the impression also here in Germany, in German politics, um, that people are waiting for this deus ex machina um, to bring us uh, closer to our climate goals. Um, but that's not what we need to do. We need to seize every chance that we can get. We need to use every options. Um, and I am convinced that uh, we already have a lot of concepts and we already have a lot of technology that we need in order to bring this transition uh, forward. One of those, um, I'm convinced, are smart grids. Um, so I just want to very quickly introduce yourselves again um, to the concept of smart grids. What is a smart grid actually? Um, it, it lost a bit of its uh, charm as a, as a buzzword in the last couple of years. I think um, it's, uh, 
it was uh, now blockchain that everyone was talking about and not smart grids anymore. Um, but especially around the time when we finished the first of our consecutive projects um, here in Berlin, uh, which was around uh, 2014, 2015, um, everyone was talking about smart grids in the energy business. Um, the Joint Research Center of the European Union, the JRC, um, does have a database which actually um, counts and analyzes um, most of the smart grid projects um, within Europe. Um, last time I checked, they counted about 950 projects. Um, I don't know, Yvonne, maybe you can uh, tell us a bit more later on if your project also is part of this database. Um, ours was, and I tried to check, um, and I didn't find it anymore, so um, maybe they, they kick out old projects, I don't quite know, but there is quite a lot going on with smart grids in Europe. So what is a smart grid actually? Um, when you Google smart grid, um, you will most likely get something like this you can see here. Um, there are houses, there are different kinds of production units, uh, wind farms, uh, uh, solar panels on roofs, uh, and a lot of times there is uh, some kind of central energy management system in the middle that uh, actually steers everything and controls everything. Um, but there is no universal definition of a smart grid. And um, a lot of projects uh, um, use their own definitions, um, but there is some kind of a, uh, of a common ground, I would say, and that is if you take a physical energy infrastructure that could be a gas infrastructure, that could also be electricity, obviously, um, and overlay this infrastructure with a data and information layer. That is like the, the, the common ground for all smart grid projects. Um, smart grids can also vary in size, obviously. They can be as big as Estonia. Um, a lot of people would argue that Estonia also uh, already has some kind of nationwide smart grid. They can also be as small as a household. Um, sometimes you can also um, find the notion of a microgrid, um, which sounds a bit similar. Um, in most cases, a microgrid um, is just different to uh, the account that it can go, uh, let's say, offline. It can disconnect from the public grid and still keep on going. So microgrids are very often islands. They are boats. You could say that every cruise ship is some kind um, of a microgrid, maybe not as intelligent as we um, uh, will talk about here later, um, but you could argue for that. Um, also, smart grids can have uh, can vary in size, but they can also vary in the kind of components they use. Um, I think most common are things like um, solar installations, uh, wind farms, but also electric vehicles, heat pumps, and storage devices, from batteries um, to uh, other storage devices. I will come to that later also. Um, another thing um, is that smart grids are even though we might not realize all the time, more or less the foundation of other technologies like demand side management. Um, Dirk, you already mentioned in your introduction um, that we need to bring um, production and uh, uh, consumption into balance. Um, we can do that with uh, making demand and production more flexible. Um, that is also something that uses forecasts and obviously the technological basis for that um, is some kind of smart grid approach. Um, that might all sound a bit um, uh, a general, so I want to give you an idea about a real smart grid, the one um, I worked on for five and a half years, um, which, like I said, is uh, situated in Berlin um, on an old energy campus where in the 1920s, uh, huge, the, the municipal gas company actually made gas from coal to fire up the streetlights. Um, and they stored it in a, in a big gasometer, in a big gas storage. 
um, which is now a landmark. Um, and that is a campus that is nowadays um, uh, very known um, for its, its innovation potential. There's a university on there. There are a lot of startups. Um, and in the middle of that, um, there um, is this micro smart grid we put up there. Uh, you can see now we combined the micro grid and the smart grid. Um, that is because we use a lot of uh, technologies that are actually smart grid technologies. We are connected to the public grid, but we could also go into islanding mode and cut off um, from the public grid and do our own operations as well. So that was um, how the name um, came into being. Um, and like I said, we also used a lot of different elements for the smart grid. Um, the, the project itself um, actually consisted of a lot of consecutive joint research projects with in total um, about 80 uh, companies, universities, research institutes that worked on this project. Um, and there were, um, it started with one project where some kind of basic infrastructure was being put up, um, a, a solar mover that moved with the sun, um, a battery storage and uh, an EV charging station. Um, but then it grew further and further. And with every new research project that was um, added to the portfolio, the, the micro smart grid grew. Um, in the end, we had uh, four solar installations on the campus. We had six micro wind turbines, um, two of them actually on the landmark gasometer in 18 meters, 80 meters height. Um, we had um, micro um, uh, CHPs. We have a large CHP that is now hooked up to the micro smart grid, fuel cells, a lot of different things. Um, and it developed into some kind of test bed also for other research institutes. We had the ability to measure what is happening on a very, very fast scale. We could measure um, 44,000 um, data points a second. Um, so we could also do frequency controls. Um, it was more a research project than an actual uh, smart grid like we would imagine to roll out um, all over Europe. Um, I also mentioned EVs. Um, it was also not only a test bed for different energy technologies, but also for shared um, mobility. Um, with this uh, micro smart grid that was the, the home base, uh, let's call it like this, for the world's first fully electric car sharing fleet that went into operation, um, which was multi-city. So it was the first fully electric. Um, and that was the home base there. And we could also use those cars um, to do all kinds of research about vehicle to grid. We had some vehicles that were actually able to feed back um, energy into the grid when it was needed. So we could um, add more batteries to our portfolio to, to steer. Um, we did tests with autonomous um, driving. We had a three deep printed driverless shuttle that was going around the campus and was bringing um, people, people to the research uh, institutes. Uh, we had inductive charging infrastructure. Um, so all kinds of uh, other research projects um, uh, actually uh, uh, came in there and added to the value of what we can actually um, see. We also um, not only did research, but we also did some kind of um, education. Uh, I already mentioned that we had um, a university with on the campus. Um, so there were a lot of um, uh, uh, groups with international politicians that came in and wanted to see how do smart grids work. Um, we had a large showroom that was more or less in the middle of this whole thing. Um, with um, bulletproof windows um, to the transformer, to the switching units, to the batteries, um, which was quite complicated to put up because there are a lot of um, standards um, in place that you have to meet. Um, also, I already said we could switch to islanding mode with a, a CHP plant um, that was actually 
uh, building up the, um, the, the, the grid frequency. Um, and then the uh, solar arrays could actually add up to that. Um, the, the vision behind that was to show what is technologically possible, what is feasible, um, and to duplicate that, to make it obviously a bit more easy to implement, but to duplicate that into many, many districts that actually interconnect in the end, um, that can help each other if there is a shortage of energy in one district, um, it could be leveled out with another micro smart grid. Um, this project here, this micro smart grid on the Europe campus, um, to be honest, it was and is far from economically viable to build some kind of a, a joint business case around that, but that wasn't necessary because I think um, research projects don't have to be economically viable all the time. Um, but we um, later on founded a spin-off that actually took some of the concepts from this micro smart grid and transferred that to the real world. Um, so some elements um, are actually applied in, in Berlin and uh, around Europe uh, by this company called Inno2Grid right now. Um, we also saw, um, and that is now something like a lessons learned, that most of the problems we had were not with technology. So from a technological point of view, pretty much everything we could imagine was possible. Um, but to build business cases around that um, was very hard because it was restricted very toughly by regulation, um, by expensive metering concepts you have to put up to um, be compliant with regulation. Um, but technology was never the problem. We, so we know we have a problem. Um, we know that we do have technological solutions to that. Um, and what was for me very interesting was the three and a half years um, of policy work I did afterwards because um, my time at the campus was very hands-on um, and we were very deep into the technology and into uh, how our control system would work and stuff like that. But we didn't actually take a lot of care about how would that be on a macroeconomic scale if we would reply, reply that um, time and time again. Um, I, for one thing which I learned was that a smart grid alone with some kind of control unit in the middle is not very realistically because um, to optimize the state of the smart grid needs some kind of incentive. Um, and this incentive, if you want to scale, needs to be some kind of price signals that come from, um, from markets um, that are overhead. Um, also, I think that um, the, 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 the notion of autonomy, of being able to cut off from the grid and do your own thing, that might be something that from a technology point of view is very interesting and is uh, a fancy to achieve, um, but it is not something that on a macro level um, should be encouraged because then you have people most of the times in those projects, there is more money than uh, vulnerable users around would have. Um, and you take money out of the system um, by optimizing yourself. So it's a, it's a bit of a, um, yeah, a, a situation that you don't want to scale up. Um, how can smart grids still help us um, with the energy transition to bring it forward? I think they are a very important piece of the puzzle. Um, when we look at how prices of technology developed, um, then I think there is one thing that a lot of people don't realize. Um, if those prices undercut a, th a certain threshold, then some kind of universal truth that we thought to be um, relevant actually shifts. I give you one example. Um, when solar prices or, or offshore wind prices um, continue to fall like they did in the past, um, we will come to a point 
where the grid is more expensive to connect them to the grid um, and has more problems because you have problems with exactums, you have huge infrastructure projects that take a lot of time. Um, whereas it, the, the, in former times you always said, put the windmills there where you have the most wind. Um, nowadays, the technology is so far that in, when you take the business as a whole or the, or the macroeconomic um, uh, factors, then in, as a system cost, it is cheaper to put the windmills where there's less wind, but you have the demand for the wind and you don't need that much infrastructure projects. Um, also, uh, and smart grids can obviously play a big part in that to bring wind and solar um, capacity um, into the field. Um, another thing is that with this super cheap sustainable technology, um, our children will be used to that. There was a large comprehensive study of uh, the Berkeley Labs, um, which looked at um, success factors for wind farms and for their um, acceptance uh, within the communities and one factor was participation and one factor was if you grow up with a wind farm in your vicinity you are much more likely to have a positive attitude toward that um, so that is something i think over the years we will see the effect of that um, and also smart grids um, tend to be more um, participative um, and can have a positive impact also on the, on the acceptance of renewable energy um, installations. Um, I'll come to my last two slides now. Besides acceptance, there's also a transformative impact of local smart grids because they bring value into the communities. If you think about um, a huge wind farm that is put up in front of your community that you don't participate with, um, then the value added goes somewhere else. Um, if your community actually initiates a wind farm like this, if you put yourself together with local businesses, with industry, um, and initiate a project like this, then the value added, the money stays within your community. And that also, I think, is, can be a huge contributing factor to bringing the um, energy transition as a whole um, forward. When we look at policy now, um, I think that, uh, and I found this, this little picture that is actually not about energy at all, but about organizational structures. Um, and if you look at some of those, um, of those little figures, I think there are remarkable similarities to what we actually need within policy. Um, to get the energy transition going. One thing obviously is from hierarchies to networks. Um, that is something that the energy transition brings naturally, um, but also from controlling to empowering. Um, if I put myself in the shoes of policymakers right now, um, I think it's very hard for them to let go and to let some kind of self-organization within smart grid projects, within um, communal projects within co cooperatives happen, um, but it's actually something that is empowering the people to be a part of the energy transition and bring it forward. Um, and I think this new kind of mindset is something that plays a crucial role. And um, I hope uh, that is a, also a good introduction for Christine, um, who will later on talk about the values that policy actually needs to incorporate um, into their smart grid efforts. And with that, thank you very much.